Amen, amen. Good morning and praise the Lord, everybody. I invite everyone to stand in the house of the Lord. I'm excited. I feel the spirit of David that's come upon me that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I had a wonderful weekend with family, didn't you? Praise God. Ate a lot of food, maybe a little too much. Amen. But now I'm excited to get back on a Sunday morning, lift up the King of Kings, uh, because in the spirit of thanksgiving, he's what I'm most thankful for. His spirit, his blood, his name, his word. Amen. I'm thankful for the presence of God in the midst of our lives. Amen. So I invite everybody, will we lift every hand up to heaven? Would you invite the presence of the Lord to touch you? Pray a simple prayer. God, whatever you want to do on me today, I open my spirit, Lord. I don't hinder you. Whatever you want to do, Lord, have your way, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we come before you being thankful first and foremost. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise. We thank you, Lord, for your blessed and holy name that you've given to us, God. Thank you for the assembly of the believers, God. Thank you for this wonderful institution that we get together, gather together with one another and lift up your holy name. Jesus, we invite you to move in our presence. God, I pray for those that are traveling, that are watching online. Bless them in their homes. Bless them in their cars, God. Help somebody to feel the presence of God like they haven't felt in a while. We invite you, Lord, to touch the musicians, God. Move in the worship set, God. I pray you touch the man of God as he delivers the word. We open our hearts, God. We take our schedule, Lord, and we lay it on the altar. Whatever you would have us to do, Jesus, we're open to it, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Christian Life Center, special presence of God. Just one more time, I invite you, lift your hands, uh, open your hearts, uh, pray, Jesus, uh, this is your service, God. Jesus, uh, whatever you would do, I'm open to it, Lord. Uh, I love you. I'm hungry for you. Uh, I want more of you. Hallelujah. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to have a wonderful service today. Invite the music team to come. Praise God. You may be seated if you like. Praise the Lord, everybody. How many of you are thankful for the God you serve? How many of you are thankful for the miracle working power that is in the name of Jesus? Can you go ahead and clap your hands to him? We're going to go ahead and testify of the goodness of our God this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead and put your hands together this morning. Testify of what he's done. Say, water you turn. Water you turn into wine. And you open the eyes. Open the eyes of the blind. Oh, there's no.
I know we know the words to this song. And sometimes when we sing songs over and over throughout the years, they sometimes lose the meaning. But these words still testify of a truth that we have when we are bound with Jesus in relationship. If our God is for us, then who or what can stand against us? And the answer to that is absolutely nothing. So if you have that testimony, if you know what he's brought you through, then I want you to lift your voice and sing it loud. Say it loud. And if our God is for us, moment longer it feels good in the house go ahead and lift up a hand go ahead and give him a hallelujah whatever it is give him something more give him something more if we came for him we might as well entertain his presence if you came for the king of kings you might as well entertain his presence
How many of you believe in that God that we are singing about this morning? We put our faith and complete trust in Him and in Him alone. And today we're going to pray to that Jesus that saved us and gave us hope. And we're going to pray that the Lord touch this city, touch this community, as according to the word of the Lord in Isaiah 43. We're going to speak to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And as we do, maybe think back in your mind to the Thanksgiving table who was sitting across north, south, east, and west to you. And pray for those individuals. And then think of the person to the north, the south, the east, and the west of your home. The north, the south, the east, and the west to your cubicle or wherever you are at your workplace. And speak those names out. Those are the people that we're praying for right now. Jesus, we go before your throne right now for Stockton, California. May your will be done in Stockton as it is in heaven. May your will be done in this state as it is in heaven. May your will be done in this country as it is in heaven. Let your righteousness prevail. Let your spirit be poured out upon all flesh. Jesus, we speak to the north. We speak to the south, the east, and the west. That it must give up the souls that belong to you from our family and friends and and our home and our workplace and and our schools and the place that we walk, whether we're in line at Walmart or Target or whether we're walking down the street or whether we're doing our job or whether we're eating our lunch at a restaurant. Jesus, we speak to the north, the south, the east and the west that those individuals will sense your spirit that is living inside of us, that we will be bold witnesses for you. And Jesus, we ask that you'll touch the leadership of this state and the leadership of, of this country, that they will be poured out your spirit upon all flesh and they will be included. Let your Holy Ghost reign upon them. Lord, your word says that you raise up and you bring down kings. Lord, we ask that your will be done. The Araboria Santa. That you'll touch our firefighters and our police department. That you'll touch all those that that are coming to our aid. That your hand of protection be upon them, Jesus. That you'll touch our schools. That you'll touch our businesses. That your spirit reign upon this community. Jesus, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for acting upon them, Jesus. We give you glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah! And we're going to go before the Lord for our individual needs. And maybe there's something that you were aware of over Thanksgiving. A family member kind of brought a situation to you because they felt the Holy Ghost inside of you. And you're like, well, I don't have the answer. (laughs) I don't know how to handle this situation, but I'm going to bring it before the Lord in prayer. And we're going to do that today. So if you're standing in for a family member of you yourself, need a healing in your body, you have a situation in your life, that you need the Lord to intervene. And just simply, before we go to the Lord in needs, just simply think for the last year. We're coming upon the last, uh, the end of the year, and think about what the Lord's done for you in the last year. Think about the healings that he's done and the provision that he's made. And that family member that you thought, ah, oh, there's, there's really, <laughs> as a human, I don't really have much hope for this person. But Jesus, ah, Jesus intervened. Simply raise your hand saying, Jesus, I'm going to testify right now in the sanctuary that you did something great for me this year if it weren't for Jesus so now we're going to put our hands down and we're going to say Jesus I need you to do it again and I raise my hand right now for another situation you did it yesterday you did it last month you did it in January you did it landmark and you're going to do it again right now in this sanctuary Jesus we go before your throne right now for every need represented in this sanctuary your word says that by your stripes we are healed your word guarantees that you are our provider when we are faithful to you Jesus Lord we ask that you intervene in every family and every situation that's represented in this sanctuary and all those that are participating online we ask that you touch and intervene in Jesus Jesus' name we pray. We thank you, Lord, for what you did yesterday and last week and last month and last year and 5 and 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. Jesus, we glorify you for it and we bring the next situation to you in complete faith, believing that you'll intervene again.
Let's all together thank the Lord for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Jesus. We're so thankful, Jesus. Hallelujah! Let's all shout hallelujah together. One, two, three. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We have a couple of announcements to bring your attention. Uh, you may be seated if you'd like as we bring these to your attention. Landmark is coming up in January, end of January. And because of that, of course, we have our Landmark Choir. Our first rehearsal is going to be Thursday, December the 1st. Thursday, December the 1st. And that's going to be at the West Lane Campus at 7 o'clock. And so if you'd like to participate in the Landmark Choir, we invite you to do so. Also, our Youth Revival is coming up <laughs> December the 2nd and the 3rd, December the 2nd and 3rd, very soon. It's going to be a great time in the Holy Ghost, and those are going to be special guest speaker. Brother Caleb Herring is going to be with us. It's going to be a great time in the Holy Ghost. Our new members orientation is December the 3rd. Register at clministry.com slash landmark. And so if you are new to Christian Life Center and have not yet attended our orientation, we invite you to do so. Maybe you've been teaching a Bible study, working with somebody, and not, not yet attended the orientation, and again, invite them to do that. Also, as always, at this time of year, we do our Share the Joy. Share the Joy, and this is provided uh, through our children's ministry. You need to give by December the, the 18th, and this, these funds specifically go toward members within this congregation, members within our church that maybe uh, didn't have quite a, a, a great year. And maybe they're struggling a little bit and they need a little bit of something. Maybe it's a nice Christmas meal or maybe a few gifts for the kids. And so we invite you to, again, donate to that. Contact the children's ministry or write, share the joy as we go to the offering. Share the joy and all those funds will go to those specific needs. The church is always wonderful at that every single year. It's now time for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. If we could stand this morning as we go before our declaration today. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy, he shall dest not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts, Malachi 3.10. Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider. As one who gives tithes and offerings, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into your storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises, bonuses, sales, commissions, promotions, and benefits in favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth, and that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interest, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings, bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt-free. Spiritual blessings follow the giver. I declare that my whole family is saved in relationship with God. We receive perfect health and healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor of the God, blessings of the Almighty. I am blessed coming in and going out, and all that I put in my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. Jesus, this morning we make this declaration to you based upon your word. God bless you as you give this morning.
so wonderful to see everybody in the house of the Lord this morning. Church, why don't we give our guests and visitors a hand? Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. We hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. And if you are new to Christian Life Center, we invite you to our Genesis room. Out these doors to my right, your left, you'll see the room called the Genesis room. Have a cup of coffee, get to know you, and answer any questions that you might have about our ministry. So wonderful to have everybody in the house of the Lord. Camarina family, great to see you here today. Church, why don't we greet one another? If you find somebody you don't know, make sure you introduce yourself. Hallelujah. Anyone glad to be in the house of God today? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you can start making your way back to, this, to your seats. The Word of God says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good of good report. Amen. If there's any, any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. Amen. Amen. We have had a blessed week, a week where we have celebrated Thanksgiving. Amen. And if there's ever virtue, if there's ever anything good, it's during this week when we're reflecting back. Amen. And thinking upon all the great things that God has done for us and how God has raised up this nation. Amen. The United States of America. Hallelujah. We are a blessed country. Amen. And we are blessed to have a country that allows us the freedoms to worship God freely. Amen. Although sometimes that's been in question in the past few years. But praise God, we're going to praise Him anyways. Hallelujah. Amen. A land of freedom, a land of liberty, and the mercies of God have been poured out on us. I feel that perhaps many times we... Uh, as a community, as a people, have lost the art in many ways of celebration, the art of celebration. I think celebrating is a good thing. 
celebrating is a godly thing, which is why I read this scripture here. Celebrating is a wonderful and godly thing. When we come together, when we have a big Thanksgiving turkey and we carve it up and we are happy and reminiscing together, that's a spiritual thing. Amen. Thanksgiving is a spiritual thing. The holidays are a spiritual thing, and I encourage you. Amen. Celebrate the most you can during this season. Celebrate with each other, and let's be grateful for what God has done in our lives. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Can we stand to our feet? It's just, it's just something that's, that's a, a, a little bonus thing that the Lord placed in my heart, and really something that I've been thinking about and meditating about. Amen. And, and just reminiscing here, it's so easy to go past birthdays and it's so easy to just do business as usual and come to church and do, go through the holidays and just treat it like any other thing. When? If it's lovely, we should think about it. If it's a virtue, we should think about it and let God minister to our hearts through it. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to read the word of God today. And uh, today... Uh, we are, I'm so grateful to be here today, and I'm so privileged to give this message here the Lord has placed in my heart for you all. Amen. I want to talk about three things today. The power of God, the mercy of God, and the hiddenness of God. The power of God, the mercy of God, and the hiddenness of God. And I want to invite you to open up your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. And I want to talk about these three things because these are three things that Satan cannot account for. These are three things that Satan cannot prepare for. These are three things that Satan cannot strategize against. The power of God, the mercy of God, hallelujah, and the hiddenness of God. I feel the Holy Ghost today. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to stay in the book of Colossians here. Uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might. Hallelujah. According to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Thank you, Jesus. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Lord God, we come before you today. We thank you, God, for your spirit. Oh, we thank you for your presence, God, that's here in this place. Kolobosha, I feel your anointing, God, on your word, making it alive, God, that it would search us in our hearts and our minds and transform us today. We give ourselves wholly and completely to the ministry of your word. Have your way, God, in our lives this morning. Have your way in our hearts and our minds as your people, God. Empower us, Lord God, today by your power. Lord Father, wash us clean, God, by your blood, Jesus. And hide us, God, in your glory and hide us in your will. Kodobo shadabaha today, God. Hey, we just submit ourselves to you, God. And whatever you want to do, God, this morning, we have bound together. We're bind, bounded together, Jesus, uh, under this roof, God, by your will. Lord Father, have your way today. Today, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, bless my heart, my mind, God, my mouth, God, to be a faithful steward of the mysteries of God today, ha, that you would anoint my lips, God, to bring forth, God, this mystery, God, and a revelation of who you have called us to be, God, uh, in this world, who you have called us to be, God, in the kingdom, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And we give you the praise. We give you the glory, God. We exalt your name for all that you will do today in Jesus' name. Oh, can somebody just lift them up right now with some joyful noise, something to exalt his name because he's worthy, because he's worthy, because he's worthy. Oh, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. 
Thank you, Jesus. You can take your seats today. Today, I want to talk about the power, the mercy, and the hiddenness of God. And uh, the reason why, again, I stated before and I'll state it again, the reason why I've, the, the Lord has placed in my heart to speak of these three things is because these are three things that Satan cannot account for, he can't prepare for, and he cannot strategize against. These are the elements of our life as Christians and children of God, amen, that set us above and beyond the attack of the enemy and whatever Satan should try to throw our way amen and first I'm going to take us through here the power of God we've read here in the book of Colossians that God he has given us something special amen and the apostle Paul is speaking to the Colossians he's saying our desire and our prayer for you is that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? It's because that is the first step to receiving these blessings of God and receiving the power of God is that you are filled with wisdom and understanding about what God has given you. Amen. See the world in a secular way, they call this Access, amen. Access to be knowledgeable about access. And within the community that we live in today, within our nation, within our city, we see that we as citizens, we have natural access to certain things and certain rights and certain things that we can ask for and expect of our government and of our nation. However, if you are not aware of your access, then you cannot take advantage of the rights that are yours by nature. Amen. Because I am a citizen of the United States, uh, I have access to a sidewalk, I have access to drive, amen, to drive on, uh, on, uh, down the roads, I have access to government buildings, I have access to representation within the legal system, I have access to all these kinds of things. Uh, but if uh, me as a citizen, uh, I do not feel or I do not know about my access, then I cannot take advantage uh, and do the the things that I have a right to do as the citizen of the United States. It's the same way with a child of God. And many times uh, we've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ uh, and we've been full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, but because we don't have knowledge and wisdom of his word, uh, we're not aware of the access uh, that we have to walk in authority and to walk in power, to walk in the confidence uh, that God expects us to have if you don't have his word you're not going to have his power because you may have the spirit working on the inside of you but the sword of the spirit is the word of God that's Ephesians the sword of the spirit is the word of God what does that mean too many of us have power without the word without substance it's like you having strength but without a sword you can't fight in this world you can't can't fight the wiles of the enemy you can't fight the attacks of Satan if you don't have both power which is the strength of the hand and the word which is the sword to combat hallelujah so the apostle Paul says this is first of all my desire that God would fill you with wisdom and understanding he wants your eyes to be open open up your eyes and see what God has given you you have a right as a child of God to access certain things but if you're not aware of them hallelujah you're going to suffer loss and you're going to suffer attacks of the enemy he's going to take advantage of our ignorance but Today, I pray that the spirit of revelation come on God's people so that we can open up our eyes and live in the victory that God has destined us to have. Hallelujah. And he says this, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing, increase in the knowledge of God, know who your God is. Strengthen with all might, according to what? According to his glorious 
power, strengthened with all might uh, according to the glorious power of God. Why? Because the power of God does not compare to the power of man. The power of man cannot compare to the authority of the power of God. Our willpower cannot compare to his power. Our decision and our mental exercises uh, to empower ourselves uh, is nothing to be compared uh, with the experience uh, of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, so he says, be strengthened, hallelujah, not according to self-help books uh, and not according to psychological strategies uh, on how to motivate yourself, but strengthen yourself uh, according to the mighty and glorious working of the power of God. Hallelujah. What am I trying to say? You see, I'm not trying to say that there aren't any good and wise things out there that we can learn from. But what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't be leaning on the arm of flesh to empower us to keep moving on. We shouldn't be leaning on earthly strategies for us to continue forward another day. But we should be using our faith in God and the power of the Holy Ghost. So much that I could say there, amen, but we have to move on. Amen. You see, when you're empowered by the glorious power of God, you rise above the powers and the principalities of this world. You are able to rise above the attack of the enemy and the influence of the enemy. Why? Because Satan can never and will never overpower, hallelujah, the power of God. He cannot challenge him. He cannot challenge his mind. And because he cannot challenge God, he cannot challenge and defeat us as his people. That's why Satan's primary strategy is to attack the wisdom and the knowledge of the church and not to attack the church head on. What am I talking about? The way that Satan defeats the church, it's not because Satan is more powerful than the church because we have the Holy Spirit resident within in us. The way that Satan defeats the church is by deceiving. It's about corrupting our own minds and getting us to stop using the name of Jesus Christ it's to he gets us to stop using the power that's already within us it is not a toe-to-toe -to -toe thing. In other words, uh, Satan is not the opposite of God. Uh, like heat is the opposite of cold. Uh, like ice is the opposite of fire. Like up is the opposite of down. Why? Because God has no opposite. Uh, he has no equal opposing other. The word of God says that he is God and he is God alone uh, and no one can stand beside him. He is the almighty Lord. Ooh, halabasha. Yeah, and Satan is not almighty in his evil. He is not almighty in his attack against the church. We are standing with the one true God who has no equal and no opposite. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word of God says... Matthew chapter 11 verses 12 through 13 that from the days of John the Baptist uh, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence uh, and the violent take it by force. Hallelujah. It says the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence from the times of John the Baptist. What does this mean? This means that in the time of Matthew before even Jesus was born the kingdom of heaven was already aware that something was going on in the ancient times and those ancient times uh, something was already happening both the angelic world and the demonic world began to move it began to shift uh, and Satan had many years ahead of the ministry of Jesus Christ uh, to begin to prepare uh, for the coming of the ministry of God manifested in the flesh the word of God uh, lets us know that Jesus he didn't even begin his ministry until third 
30 years old, about 30 years old. He didn't even begin healing the sick. He didn't even begin preaching the good news of salvation until he was 30 years old. You know what that means? That means Satan had a 30-year head start to prepare everything he needed to prepare. And violence began to occur. People began to be possessed by demonic powers. Individuals were being caught up in sin. And he was sowing as much transgression within that ancient time as he could. Why? Because he knew that someone was coming after John the Baptist. Someone who was coming with anointing and power. And he had to prepare the atmosphere to fight against the coming power. But nothing could prepare him. And nothing could set him straight against the authority in Jesus Christ. We see in the word of God that there wasn't even a resistance. As soon as Jesus walked into a building and a demon began to manifest, he'd say, shut up and come out of him. There was no resistance as much as Satan wanted to prepare. He could not resist the power of God. Many years and many years, individuals possessed by demons. And in one moment, by the authority of Jesus Christ, they were casted out. And the, he the sick were healed in Jesus' name. And miracles began to occur. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for you and me? It means that it doesn't matter how long you have walked away from God. It doesn't matter how long you've lived in the world. It doesn't matter how dark God has made your mind. It doesn't matter how corrupt God has made your soul. You're in the house of God now and one touch of his power can set you free. Is anyone hearing me in the house of God today? It doesn't matter how long you've spent out there in the world. Oh, God can't change me. I've done too much. I've said too much. I'm way too evil. This church doesn't know me and has never seen somebody as dark as me. Hallelujah. Yes, perhaps I never have. But Jesus, he's able to change what man cannot change. He's able to transform. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Does anyone know what I'm talking about tonight, this morning? Does anyone know what I'm talking about this morning? I'm sure there are many of you here who have thought the same thing. Oh, there's no way God can change me. There's no way God can change this. But it was one encounter in the altar where the Holy Ghost, it changed everything in our hearts and our minds. Because Satan, he cannot prepare he cannot prepare for the power of God. See, the word of God tells us that there is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. Why? Because all the prophets, they prophesied until John the Baptist. This means that John, he was the final prophet talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. But the word of God says that even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than even John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist didn't experience what it was like to be filled with the Holy Ghost like we are. He didn't receive that new covenant that we have received. He didn't know what it was like to be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ and be washed clean of our of his sins but we have and Jesus has cleansed us by his blood and he has invested his spirit within us and even the least of those who are here in this building you are greater than John the Baptist why because you have a power that is living on the inside of you thank you Jesus I want to Take us here to Colossians 1.13 and keep on reading here. The word of God says he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Praise God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, 
all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have preeminence. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The second thing that Satan cannot account for, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God of God the grace of God you see God has given us power yes and he has given us the ability to be victorious in our life but even if we should fail <laughs> Even if we should stray from the path of God, even if we should be overcome by the enemy and overcome by temptation, there is one other thing that Satan cannot account for, and it is the mercy of God. That even when we fail and even when we fall out of the way, there is still a God that is able to redeem, a God that's able to restore. You see, that's why we pray for our backsliders hallelujah that's why we pray for those who have come and they have left because we know that there is still power in the blood hallelujah and it flows to the lowest valley and it flows to the highest mountain and there is no place where the mercy of God cannot reach you see the reason why we feel so far from God when we fall into sin is because we have a good understanding of the holiness of God, of the purity of God, of the greatness of God. And many times the enemy uses that to his advantage to try to sow within us a shame that leads to condemnation, a shame that tries to convince us, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to live. Uh, a righteous life anyways all right and that is one of the most typical lies it is a common lie that Satan tries to put in our mind we tell ourselves I'm never going to make it to heaven anyways I might as well enjoy life along the way I might as well enjoy sin why because I know I'm never going to make it anyways I'm always going to keep falling time and time again I'm going to keep falling into sin but the word of God says that the righteous man he fall six times and he rises a seventh hallelujah why because satan thinks he has you and many times he himself is convinced satan himself many times is convinced that he has you and you're never going to leave hallelujah but jesus christ is trying to tell you otherwise that it doesn't matter what you've done and how you have walked away from god there is still power in the blood of jesus christ there is still power and mercy is waiting for you there is room by the cross for you there is room in this altar for you there is a place in this altar that's waiting for a backslider that's listening to this preaching today there is a place in this altar that has your name on it and Jesus is just waiting for you to come back to the house of God Woo. And I rebuke the lie of the enemy that's trying to tell you that you're not going to make it. I'm here to tell you today, God has already made a plan for you. He's already set a destiny before you. He's already destined you to make it. We're going to make it to heaven. And just like we're praising God here in this church, we're going to be praising God in heaven, glorifying his name. Hey, because just when the devil thinks he has us down, then the mercy of God comes in and sweeps us off the ground and gives us a new life. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.
Thank you, God. Praise God. I want to read a scripture here. It's very powerful. In 1 Corinthians, hallelujah, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? You see, that's true. We cannot find any way to say that that is not true. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sinners will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the truth. We cannot put it any other way. I can't sit here and say that, oh, eventually everybody goes to heaven and all, you know, though you may find your way, you know, uh, you can sin a little bit and that's all right. And you can, you know, you don't have to live righteously. It's, just, it's all symbolic and it's all metaphorical. There's nothing metaphorical about this. Uh, that's what the word of God says. It says, do not be deceived. You know what that means? It means that even in the time of the apostle Paul, this was a problem. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But the word of God says in verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God there was no sin that was too dark and too deep I'm here because the blood still works I'm here because the mercy of God is so good and such were some of you. But guess what? We're still here praising the name of Jesus. And such were some of you. But the mercy of God, it picked us up right on time. Just when we thought that we lost it all, just when we thought we were too far gone, the mercy of God, he changed things around. The word of God, hallelujah, indicates that such were some of us. But the power of God, the mercy of God is able. He's able to wash us clean. He's able to give us a new start. And that's simply something that Satan cannot plan for. He cannot strategize against the mercy of God. Is even if he has years and years of wins against you. Is we tend to look at our lives in Jesus Christ like a game. Like some type of score. Some tally that we keep. Some type of football game that says, well, you know, this was a, this was a blowout here. Some type of basketball game where, oh, they run up the score. You're... Losing by, you're losing by 30 points and there's only a minute left in the game, right? You're losing by 14 points. There's only a, a minute left in the game, a few seconds left in the game. Hallelujah. And many times we look at our lives that way. Like if Satan has scored so much against us, he's run up the score of our failures. He's run up our sins. And there's no way we can make it out. Hallelujah. But there's something about God that defies the logic of the world. It defies the logic of Satan. It defies the logic of the enemy. We can have our score run up so deep. Hallelujah. There's only a few seconds. But as soon as we call on the name of Jesus, God. God can settle the score and say, hey, you may be right in the real world. You should be dead in the real world. You should be too far gone. But in the world of God, his blood, it pays the price. Ooh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Does anyone know what I'm talking about this morning? Come on, does anyone know what it's like to be washed in the blood of the Lamb? I know we have imperfect people here. That's because I'm not perfect either. But I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb time and time again. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah. Now I want to talk about the hiddenness of God. The hiddenness of God. In this same chapter... Chapter 1, verse 24 of Colossians. 
Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Chapter 1, verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. You see, that's important there. Because the word of God doesn't say that it has now been revealed to everyone, to the whole world. The fact that we have the gospel written on the pages of the Bible does not automatically mean that this mystery has been revealed to the world. The word of God says that he has revealed it to his saints. And that's very important for what's to come. To them, verse 27, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is what? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wow. I want to take you now to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul speaking of the same concept in a different way. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, the word of God says that prophecies of old, the scriptures of the Old Testament, there were mes mysteries embedded in that word. The word of God says that they were shadows of the things that were to come. So many times the writers of the Old Testament, they would write under the unction of the Holy Spirit, the power of God would be in their hearts and their minds, Breathing on them to write scripture, infallible and inerrant. <clears throat> writing that scripture down, in writing that scripture down, they thought they knew what they were speaking about. And many times they were aware that they didn't know. And many times the Holy Spirit would move on them so powerfully that they knew that they were writing a mystery. That they received of the mystery. The book of Hebrews talks about this in chapter 11. It talks about the heroes of the faith. Uh, and individuals, these men of God of old. It says desire to look into these things. They had this burning desire to look into the very prophecies that they were writing. Yet God would not give them access. God would not allow them to access a mystery that was destined for another time. And so hidden within the very prophecies and the very word of God was knowledge that God restricted individuals in the Old Testament to have. Now we see as well, even in the time of Jesus Christ, Jesus came preaching the gospel. He came saying what he was going to do. Even saying to his own disciples, it is important that I be sacrificed. It is important that I give my life. It is important why Jesus himself, he taught the disciples themselves of the mysteries. Yet the word of God says that the rulers of this age, which doesn't include only emperors and, and governors and rulers, uh, human beings. That also includes the very principalities 
enemies that were there in that region, the very spirits, the evil spirits and demonic powers, it was hidden from them, which means that even as Jesus was speaking somehow, God restricted their minds from having access to understanding exactly what Jesus Christ was saying. This is the same principle that he uses with the Pharisees. See, he speaks in parables. Jesus is speaking in parables, which are in stories in the Gospels. Amen. And he speaks in these parables and the apostles or the disciples, his followers ask him, why are you speaking in parables? Why don't you just come out and say very clearly what you're trying to say? And Jesus said, I am speaking in parables that hearing they may not hear and seeing they may not see lest they be converted and saved what does this mean that means that Jesus was speaking in such a way to cloud the understanding of the Pharisees because the Pharisees didn't really want to follow Jesus Christ they didn't really want to accept that God had manifested in the flesh but they were serving a God of their own imagination a God of their own fantasies that somehow was pleased with their Pharisaic ways that somehow were was pleased by what they would do and the laws and the restrictions that they would put on the people and Jesus said nope that's not the real God of the Bible that's not the real God that 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 that, that inspired the word of God so he said because of their idolatry now it wasn't an idolatry of a physical thing but it was an idolatry of their fantasy it was idolatry in their imaginations because they decided to serve a God that had no eyes, that had eyes but could not see and had ears that could not hear, hear, God spoke in such a way that it made them ignorant to understand what Jesus was actually trying to say. Now, I teach this in, in my comparative religions class in the Bible college. And an example of this that is probably similar to what is being explained of in the scripture is the example of when we are very tired. When we are tired sometimes, and I guess individuals who are studying long hours for tests and trying to memorize things, okay, there are levels of tiredness in your mind where you try to read sentences and you try to understand paragraphs, but because your mind is so weary, you you can even say them out loud with your mouth and somehow they're just not getting in there. Somehow it's just not getting recorded. Everything that I'm saying, everything that I'm reading, it's not coming into my consciousness and it's not being integrated as part of my knowledge. And you well know that you can read it as much as you want, but there is a level of tiredness where you just need to go to sleep. You need to get some rest. Okay, I don't know about you, but I still experience that today. There are some levels of tired. I'm saying, I, I, don't, I don't understand what I'm reading here. Right, this is a simple sentence. I should totally get it, but somehow, as soon as I get it, it leaves me. Okay? That is the kind of thing that would occur with the Pharisees. They would hear the teachings of Jesus and it would bounce off of their minds. And Jesus would say, I have come. I am. Right before Abraham was, I am. And instead of hearing revelation, what they heard was blasphemy. Let's stone him. All right. And this was even after Jesus was healing the sick. This was after Jesus was raising the dead. And still when he said, you have said it, I am the father. Father come in flesh they still could not perceive it why because they were serving an idol that was within their fantasies and God was restricting from their understanding the power that was resident and the salvation that was within Jesus Christ and that same ignorance was also extended to the rulers of darkness where Satan himself could have Jesus the manifestation of God right in front of him. He had the lamb that was supposed to be slain for the sins of humanity right in front of him and somehow he couldn't see and he could not make sense. There's another example of this in, in and this is important so it, it leads to what I'm trying to tell you later on here in this message. 
And another example of this is, is probably even clearer than that is the time when Lot, he was, uh, he had, he was hosting two angels. These were the angels that were telling him to leave the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the word of God says that these two angels that were in the form of man, they came to his house. And there was a whole community of individuals that came to the house of Lot attempting to violate and abuse the two angels that were there in Lot's household. And they were knocking on the door of Lot. They're saying, let us have, let us have these two men. That's how corrupt Sodom and Gomorrah was. That's how, vile, that's how vile it was and how sinful it was. That a whole community of people would came to the door of Lot seeking to violate these two men that were guests in Lot's home. He said, bring them out so that we can do whatever we want with them. And that wasn't to make them slaves. It was a very vile thing that they were attempting to do. The word of God says that these two angels struck them with blindness. Struck them with blindness. And many times we assume that this was blindness of the eyes. And it very well could have been, but it was definitely much more than that. It was absolutely much more than that. Why? Because these men were already at the door of Lot. These men were already there asking to be let in. And when the word of God says that he struck them with blindness, it says that they could not find the door. If you are blind... If right now you became blind, I could guarantee that you could find the door to leave this building. You just have to feel around. Okay, I know this aisle. I know where this leads to. Oh, there's a door here. And I can open this door. I can walk out. If you were physically blinded, you would still be able to find the door. Why? Because we're intelligent creatures. But something else happened to these men. Something else occurred. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't receive physical blindness. It very well could be. But most, most importantly is that they could not find the door. They were struck with an ignorance in their minds. They were struck with a blindness in their cognitive faculties. Where God released them and took away their ability to understand what a door is. To understand how to go in and out of doors. To understand the basic the basic structure and architecture of a simple home. They could not find it. They could not understand it. They couldn't grasp the concept of a door. That's how powerful God is. That God can take from individuals the ability to understand even the most basic things. This actually empowers our understanding of what it means. That God will give individuals a spirit of delusion so that they could believe a lie. It's very powerful. It's a very powerful thing. And many times these delusions that come into people's minds to make them believe a lie, it imitates the feeling of revelation because both revelation and delusion are given by God. And just as an individual can make sense of the word of God and we say the words jump out of the pages and they come into our mind and they bless our minds with the understanding to hear and see the glorious riches of God. So a delusion can come to people's minds that cloud their understanding and they could literally, they will in, in the time of the Antichrist, this is why that unbeliever people who do not make the rapture they will not be saved in the time of the antichrist they will not be saved in tribulation it's it's not possible why because they can literally have the church rise from the from the earth and see their own loved ones and see people that they knew rise from the ground and still somehow in their mind they cannot make sense of the fact that Jesus came for the church. They're going to turn around and go to the Antichrist and say, oh, this must be it. Why? Because God has given them a spirit of delusion because they did not love the truth. They did not have a love for the truth. I'm talking about hiddenness. I'm talking about mysteries. I'm talking about mysteries. So the word of God says that when Jesus came, when God came in the flesh in Jesus, that all the principalities of this world looked at Jesus and said, he's healing the sick and you know, he's raising people from the dead. But uh, I don't know if this is God manifested in the flesh. Not just human beings, but even Satan himself. I think this must be the son of the living God. Why? Um, okay, so he was born of a virgin, and I know that's impossible. 
But yet still he takes him onto this mount and he says, if you be the son of God, then tell these rocks to turn into bread. If you be the son of, now there are different reasons, different explanations. There are some demonic powers that seem to have a clear understanding that he was the son of God because they would say it and they would extol it with their mouth. They would say, you are the son of God. You are. And he said, why, and the demons would say when they possessed other individuals, why have you come to torture us before our time? They had some understanding that this is the son of God, that something divine is happening here, but they couldn't make more sense even after that. They couldn't put two and two together and say that the son of God has come to be the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world so that he can join all sinful people and he can draw men to him and he can become the mediator between God and man between the holiness of God the unrighteousness of man that was cleansed by his blood and they could not see it they could not perceive it why because the word was hidden from them and there was a great mystery in that it's the hiddenness of God it's the hiddenness of God but you see the word of God says here in 1 Corinthians 2 7 again but we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But the word of God says but God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things there isn't blindness in the spirit there isn't ignorance in the spirit but when you're in the Holy Ghost the word of God says that the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of God when we're in the Holy Ghost when we have the power of God moving in us we have our eyes open to see all the goodness and all the promises and all the mercies of God that even Satan himself does not have access to see. They cannot repent anymore. They cannot turn their lives away from their wickedness anymore. The demonic realm, it is cursed to continue in its path of darkness. But when you come to the Lord, the word of God says that there, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And with that liberty, he opens our eyes to see the glory of God. And we are transformed in the same image the same image of Jesus Christ Ooh, hallelujah he opens your eyes to see where before you're like I don't know why people go to that church they're crazy they run around they do all kinds of silly things you see you were still in your sin you still didn't get it you still didn't understand why why does my family member go there they're part of a cult they must be part of a cult why well they say that all the time why because because uh, we're doing weird things we're running the aisles we're shouting I'm preaching till my voice goes out who does that right who does that it seems like they're always angry and then they're happy and then they're joyful and then they're growling in the spirit and then they're interceding they're weeping they're crying and then they're jumping for joy what is this multiple personality disorder this must be some weird thing but some of you thought that way some of you had that mentality but then you came to the house of God and he said God I want what they have and the spirit filled you and he opened up your eyes and now you see there's a reason why we jump. There's a reason why we praise. There's a reason. You see, it was cloudy to your eyes, and you could not see it. But the Holy Ghost got a hold of you, and he opened up your mind and your eyes. What is this word? Why do people read it? It was written by some people long ago. Why would anybody look at this word? But then the Holy Ghost God, a hold of you. And now when you open up the word of God, you hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you and changing you. It's that mystery. 
It's that mystery that was hidden, but the Spirit, it searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. And verse 11 says, for what man knows the things of a man, except the Spirit of the man is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. No man can know. The carnal man cannot grasp this. The rationality of man, it can't it can hold it. You see, that's why when we are carnal, when we are far from God in our relationship with God, that's exactly when we begin to doubt the promises of God in our lives. Woo! Because the promises of God are too heavy for your rational mind. You don't have the hands to hold them. Oh, I feel God today. You don't have the ability to understand them. And so the promise that God gives you in an altar that you celebrated a week before, now you're doubting whether it was the word of God or not because you strayed away from your relationship with God. And now you're trying to touch these things that were received in the spirit. And you're putting in danger your future. Not because God has forgotten about you. Not because God, he spoke a lie. But because you're too busy trying to touch the promises of God with your rational mind. It's about time that the church gets a hold of the mind of God and the spirit of God. Because that same ignorance, that will, that cannot give access, it restricts access from human beings that have not received the spirit of God and have not received this revelation. It restricts access from them. It can come to us and we will not be able to stay in the will of God for our lives because we're living in this world. But the word of God says, place your eyes on the things above. Put your eyes on the things above. Why? Because the word of God, the will of God, it does not work according to the science of this world. When there is sickness, God can heal it. When there is sin, God can forgive it. When there's weakness, God can give you strength. And a strength that doesn't come from you. Because they that wait on the Lord shall mount up on we eagles' wings. They shall run and not get weary. How is that possible? I know what that feels like. Why? Because I've gotten weary before. But then I waited on God. And somehow I made it and I'm here today. Because God gave strength to my feet to run. Oh, Lord, 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 have mercy. Lord, in Jesus' name. Colossians. i got to keep going. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 2 through 3. If you have some patience, I have a few more things to say today. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. That their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's still hidden in God to this day. It's still hidden in him. Now I want to take you here to chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. <laughs> when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you shall also, you also will appear with him in glory. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Whew. You know what that means? That means that the mystery doesn't only extend to the word of God. It doesn't only extend to the gospel. It doesn't only extend to Christ. But the mystery also extends to you. You yourself are a mystery. Your whole life is a mystery. Your whole life is hidden. Woo. You are a hidden figure within this world. That the powers and the rulers of this age cannot comprehend. 
They cannot access why you are still here. They cannot understand how you have made it this far. And the world doesn't get it. They know, man, you've gone through so much. You've been through so much in your life. You've gone through ups and downs. How are you still smiling? And why do you have this joy? You see, you are a mystery to the world. And not only are you a mystery to the world, you're also a mystery to the principalities and the demonic powers of this age. They cannot access the code to how to destroy you. They cannot access the tools to bring you down. Why? Because you are not here by your own strength. You are here by the power of a God who is able to deliver you and he is able to restore you and you are hidden in Christ. You are hidden in God. Ooh. Can I tell you how powerful that is? And I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean literally. Satan is ignorant. He is not able to make meaning of your life. He cannot find a way to destroy you or to kill you. Why? Because you're hidden in Christ. And there's a plan in God for your life. There is a will and a destiny that God has given you. There is a plan that Satan cannot access. Woo. And you know what? God can even say it to you. He can even give you that promise verbally, audibly, and you can hear it. And still Satan can't make meaning of it. You know, what? You know, you know how I know this? Because there is a whole book in this Bible. It's called the book of Revelation. That talks about exactly what Satan is going to do. Exactly how he's going to do it. How he's going, try, going to try to resist Christ. And he's still going to fall. And he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit. And God can say in a whole book, this is what's going to happen. Satan's going to do this. Then he's going to do that. And he's going to make an antichrist. And in all that effort, still one will come sitting on a white horse with the name on his thigh that no one knows. And out of his mouth proceeds a sword to destroy, to conquer, and to establish a kingdom. And God can tell Satan. Satan, look, this is what you're going to do, and this is exactly how you're going to do it. And you know what Satan does? Oh, I must create an antichrist. I must create a false prophet. He has to do it exactly how God has designed it. Why? Because God has a plan. He has a plan that he's preserving. And to make that plan come to pass, he strikes the minds of Satan and the mind of the devils of this world and the mind of this world with an ignorance that cannot make meaning of the church. They cannot plan for the church. They cannot strategize for the church. Why? Because there is a prophecy that we're embedded in. The church is here. We're here to establish the kingdom of God. And in your life is hiddenness. In your life is a mystery. In your life. Meanwhile, you stay in the will of, God, will of God. No one can touch you. No one can destroy you. No one can touch your future. No one can touch your destiny. I met someone one time who was afraid of praying. They were afraid of praying, even their weaknesses. And they're saying, oh, you know, if I pray to God and I tell God all the secrets of my heart, isn't Satan going to hear me? And can't Satan use that against me? There's something about when you are in the Holy Ghost, when you're in prayer, when you're in the presence of God, it doesn't matter what you say in prayer. Satan cannot use that against you. Why? Because you're a mystery. It's an enigma. He cannot see it. Why? You're in the presence of God and you're speaking things to him. He can't cannot access your prayers he cannot access your weaknesses because in your weakness he God is made strong and through your weakness God manifests his power you don't got to be afraid about praying to God. You can pray to him. You can say, God, look, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. And because you're buried in Christ, because you're hidden in Christ, you're preserved. You're a mystery can't make sense of it why you're a child of the living God revelation says that we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony Whew. hey there's no strategy 
that can prosper against that. And there's no weapon formed against God's people that can prosper. That's the truth. It's the power. It's the mercy. And it's the mystery. The power, the mercy, and the hiddenness of our lives. I've preached much too long. we got to stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet today. Whew. Revelations 12.11. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That we will overcome means power. Power. That we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb means mercy. God's going to cleanse us. And that we will overcome by the word of our testimony means huh, that we will overcome by the word according to our testimony. This means that what God has done once, he can do it again. <laughs> the power that saved you once can save you again. The mercy that forgave you once, it can forgive you again. Because we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That testimony that you once had. Woo, that testimony that you once have had of being a powerful woman of God. That testimony that you once had of being a powerful, faith-filled man of God. That testimony that you once had of coming to the altar and being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can, be, you can receive the power of God according to the word of that testimony. That word that made that testimony possible. That principle that made that testimony possible. It's still here in the building this morning. And you can still overcome by the word of your testimony. It's not too late. You can still be a powerful woman of God. You can still be a powerful man of God. Because you will overcome. Psalm 91. This is the last thing I'm going to read. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him. I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. This is a mystery. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. It's a mystery. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. It's a mystery. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right, but it shall not come near you. It's a mystery. We're hidden in God. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Why? It's a mystery. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Why? It's a mystery. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. How can I trample on a lion? Isn't a lion supposed to be bigger than me? Isn't Satan supposed to be more powerful than me? Isn't the devil, doesn't he have experience that is greater than mine? Can I tell you, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. You're already more powerful than Satan. You're already more powerful than the devil. Why? Because you have something greater living on the inside of you. And it's the mystery that is working in your life. 
You see, somebody has to get a hold of that again this morning. You've lost it for way too long. Because the enemy has been clouding your mind. He's been trying to get you to doubt your calling. He's been trying to get you to doubt your future. But it's time to pick it back up this morning. It's time to pick up the word of God. And if you've been feeling threatened in your life, if you've been feeling, feeling, been feeling vulnerable, you can hide yourself in Jesus Christ today. You can hide yourself in his word. You can hide yourself in his mercy. You can hide yourself in his power because there's still room on the cross for you. Does anybody want that this morning? Come on. Does anybody want a touch of God today? It doesn't matter what you've been going through. It doesn't matter how far you've walked away from God this is your chance this morning this is your chance why don't you come to the presence of God and God he's going to work a mystery in your life where you should have been destroyed God's going to give you victory he's working a mystery in your heart he's working a mystery in your ministry he's working a mystery it's hidden it's hidden it's hidden but it's being revealed through you why? You're part of the plan of God. You're part of the will of God. You're part of what God is trying to do in these end times. You're part of what God is trying to work. He's trying to work a powerful thing. Come on, somebody pray. Somebody pray with groanings that cannot be uttered. Somebody pray in the mystery, in the hiddenness of the power of the Spirit. Somebody pray in tongues and allow the Spirit to pray through you. The will that is in the Spirit of God. The desires that's in the Spirit of God. Oh, the plan that's in the Spirit of God. With the groaning we call to you, Jesus. With the groaning that cannot be uttered today. The mystery that's working in the church this morning. The mystery that was hidden in the ages before is being revealed to your saints today. The power of God, the mercy of God, the glory of God, the authority of God, the love of God. Work that mystery in us today. Work that mystery in our midst today. Reveal yourself to your church. Reveal yourself to your people, God, today. Oh, if you want it, you can receive it. If you want it, you can receive it. If you desire it, you can have it. Because God is here to work it in you. He's here to change you. He's here to make, give you beauty for ashes. He's here to give you beauty for ashes. He's here to give you strength for fear. He's here to exchange what should have been for what he has designed. Kolobo shatalabaha. Oh, somebody pray in the Holy Ghost today is working. He's working in your discouragement. He's working. You're turning your discouragement around. He's turning your condemnation around. And he's giving you mercy. He's giving you grace. He's giving you love. He's giving you power. He's turning your fear around into faith right now. He's turning your fear into faith today. For it's revealed by the Spirit. And the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Come on and search the deep things of God this morning. Come on and search the deep things of God today. Come on, somebody, search the deep riches of the glory of God today. Oh, we're here to pray, God. We're here to get a hold of it today. We're here to get a hold of it today, God. We're here to get a hold of your power. We're here to get a hold of your mercy. We're here to get a hold of your spirit. Oh, don't be afraid of it today. Oh, let him work revelation in your life of who he has designed you to be today.